All right. All right. We're here. Hello. Hello, Hello there. Hey, was it happy September 15th. Yeah, it would help if I actually post the uh, right URL. <laughs> Somehow mine popped up two URLs. All right. Um, Y'all bringing in some like weird mojo. <laughs> no, let me bring it. It's not weird mojo. Don't, 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 no. Not too, too. Uh, um, <laughs> What is this? This is Piercing the Veil live stream brought to you by RVA Paranormal. Of course, we do this every Tuesday at eight o'clock and we try to, you know, keep it cool and interesting and want to bring you guys some good content. Uh, keep you coming back. And we have uh, some some awesome guests, um, not one, but two demonologists are with us. Um, Carl Johnson and James Anito uh, from Duo Demonology. And... Um, it's odd that you guys are on the show, especially you, Carl, because everybody just finished watching a documentary that came on TV not not too long ago. That's that kind of you know a little bit of it ties into you. It does in a way. You're talking about the Devil's Road about Ed and Lorraine Warren. Absolutely. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard it's excellent. You know, very topical and very thorough. It was good. <laughs> well, I mean, you lived that in a way, right? So you worked with Ed and Lorraine. I knew them personally. I worked with them, lectured with them. Yes. Uh, had dinner with them many times. And, uh, they had dinner over at my parents' house, as a matter of fact. You know, I was sitting around talking. You know, I was all them pretty good. I can only imagine the dinner conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, my father was very funny and comedic, like I am very funny and comedic. And you know, it was like, you know, it's Ed Warren with a mouthful of uh, cream corn. What's that you say, Lynn? <laughs> <laughs> and my mother and Lorraine, like, oh, Beverly, I'll tell you, I love those curtains. Do you really? Uh, no, they're not that. I think they are charming, you know. You have, you keep your house immaculate, you know, that kind of stuff is going on. And yeah, like, yeah. The Warren, so I thought they were here for me, you know. <laughs> my parents all night. But yeah, it was nice. Very and we nice. also James, look on your face is bright. Yeah, James is just like looking at you like, oh my god. Not, not oh, as yeah. personal Warren said. Very <laughs> this is my partner. crime. <laughs> you can. So all of this transpired before James and Edo was born or conceived of, or no, there was no James and Edo in these days <laughs> of yesteryear. Oh. Yeah, but uh, I, I tell him like legends around the campfire. We tell stories. You know? Yes, but yep, yeah, that's a good association back then. Yeah, he's he worked with uh, Ed and Lorraine. Unfortunately, I never got to, and but I've had the pleasure to work with the modern Nesper team, like Tony and Dan Rivera and Nesper, Chris, and um, founded by Ed and Lorraine. So even though I never got to work with them in that sphere, I got to work with the team. I you know um, and I have become acquaintances and close with those people as well. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. So it's, he, he, he worked with the, uh, the precursors, you know, he is a precursor I'm sorry, He's a legend, you know, 47 years, right? Yeah. It's I'm hard right. to denote that. It's, it's, I'm he, an old he likes it. He likes the uh, ego stroked a little bit. Oh, yeah. 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 You have to give him the credit. It's a long time, you know, uh, his, his background. And so, but, it, it's crazy how things transition and how it comes to be, and of course how we came together. So yeah. Yeah. Well, how did you guys get started? I mean, that's what everybody wants to know. Start from the beginning. <laughs> well, this goes back. Now I'm a precursor from way back. So if I met this boy. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, got it. Yeah. Oh, we met ten years ago. Actually, we were. Uh, James was associated with people who were working on a case, yeah. and uh, I was involved in that case. I had been called in because a demonologist and being consulted and uh james knew of me and i knew of james through these mutual friends and some of these friendships were torn asunder because it was a really interesting situation that had transpired in orange massachusetts in 2010 and because it was uh, you know adjudicated to be demonic it was a hostile invasive spirit influence it, it tended to really do a number on people especially the younger people being influenced and they just it actually I think it was the case the responsible was responsible for severing these friendships, but something good that came out of it besides the case was, uh, I think successfully resolved at the mm -hmm. time. And I got to know James, he uh, was introduced to me and he, I was a member of a team. He came on as our technical manager and it was a good association. Then when certain members of the team relocated, the team kind of fell apart. And, uh, 
lacked that cohesive factor to keep it together. Mm. And uh, we all relocated. James and I basically kept in touch. We would go a year without seeing each other, and suddenly we'd meet at a convention or some uh, some paranormal themed event. And then it all seemed to coalesce when uh, we met up again at Ocean State Paracon. It was conducted in Harrisville, Rhode Island. And then we worked on a case together, or actually it was a public investigation at the Payne House in Coventry, Rhode Island, where I was two nights ago. And uh, James had a proposition for me, you know, and we, we okay. actually uh, solidified this at Ocean State Paracon in 2019. And James, this was James's brainchild. He dubbed this duo demonology with the King James parlance and spelling. Right. You know, D A E and the old fashioned way and ending with I E, as it was spelled uh, back in the time of King James, the early 17th century. And that the reason for that is we are connecting the old disciplines and the old knowledge with the new and making them work together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, duo being James and myself. Even though there is a third, there is a third crossing who has managed, but she's also a historian. You know, she's the president of the Historical Society out of Rhode Island. So, those, you know, she is a key asset to this as well in, the, in that formula. So, yeah, she's ever even though it is a trio, it is duo demonology. <laughs> well, yeah, just duo demonology sounds better than trio demonology. <laughs> 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 With respect to Elise, she's vital and, you know, she's yes. important role. And she's actually watching now, so oh, good call out. <laughs> <laughs> Should have. If she wasn't a homemaker, I think she'd be with us well, right yeah, no. now. But do it immunology basically uh, was like Carl said is to bring the old into the new. Um, you know, of course, with the past documentary, they were more so the forefront of why demonology became popular in, in some so form of Yes, party, definitely. Yes. Yes. But then you have Carl Johnson and then his brother Keith Johnson, who, who are, are demonologists in everybody's right minds, their history with the mm-hmm. Conjuring House and how, how it is a big part of pop culture nowadays. So it, I, I took that formula of I respected Carl. I take a lot of accounts of why I stepped into this aspect of this field because of watching him and his brother and of course other people associated to the field of demonology but more so carl because getting to be able to work with him and of course also i met his brother keith when i used to uh run the electronics department at walmart so i used to talk to keith before i ever met carl <laughs> so it was always funny he was always asking about tape recorders or digital recorders and we always somehow talk about ghosts because i'm like oh dude i know this guy's part of taps you know so in that formula it's 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 crazy how it's come so but we are trying to take a lot of the misconceptions about demonology the paranormal maybe even in general and bring it to the forefront because what we do is we're brought into situations residential situations with people that live in their homes affected by something or even affected by their own mind and they believe it to be pretty natural forces and we have to determine and make that proposition of where to go and what to do from that standpoint. And we're playing with people's lives. So, but we want it to bring the misconceptions that people have kind of try to neutralize them as best as we can. And of course, some people won't listen. Some people will be in their ways of their format, of their formula, they're doing things, but we want to try to bring uh, misconceptions, eliminate them and understand and tell people that even though this is still a, a uh, theory, a, ther- a theoretical field of study, that there are things like psychology, neuroscience, and such other things that you can jump to that explain why the human mind does certain things or why we uh, pertain to certain elements, maybe spores in our breathing and how we can have hallucinations or, or doing drugs. So there's things that you can go to, and that's what we're, we do as duodena, duodemonology. We assess cases. We 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 take our knowledge and experience together. It's quite a, cha- a challenge to try and legitimize a field which is thought of as being, you know, like supernatural, yeah. preternatural in nature, and trying to make that a scientific approach. Yeah. Well, I thought we agreed we weren't going to discuss Keith or bring up Keith's name. <laughs> let's, let's, 
We'll be better than that right now. Well, Keith, he's not here. He's not here. But he, he will be here in this he room will be on here. Thursday. Yes, we are our own here. podcast, of course, where we do a, yeah. uh, our own podcast. Not to shamelessly plug that, but Keith will be joining us. Yes, I'm just kidding about Keith. But no, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's his brother, so he has to get <laughs> He's my twin brother, my identical twin brother. We were a zygote together. We go way back, you know. <laughs> yeah. Identical twins. Oh, God. Yeah. He's also a precursor from way he's back. A, is yeah. he a cursor to a precursor? He's not a precursor. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's the truth, though. You know, you, people. You know, people think of the Hans Holsters and uh, you know the Harry Prices and um, of course the Ed and Lorraines. But a lot, of, you know, some people do say that Carl and Keith Johnson. But there are a lot of people that don't. They don't. They don't know about you because unfortunately you were shamed in your situation where. You never were the people like well, if, if you were not so ashamed as excluded in that sense. Well, know? so yes, but like you, which I don't mind. It's well, you don't. Of it's course. been so long. Too. But still, in the same aspect, if, if they were going to use you, you and your brother yeah. because light, you know, it, it would have brought you to the masses of more so knowing who the Johnsons True. were. Well, yeah, you know, because you are known in the paranormal field, but to like the general public, a select few people know about you, and more people should know about you guys because you guys are. Thank you. Yeah. Some of the most knowledgeable people I've yeah. ever met in this world. You guys are very <laughs> articulate in the way you speak, and you're very knowledgeable. Yeah. Now, what James is referring to is that, uh, you know, when uh, that case transpired, that situation with the Perron family in Harrisville, Rhode Island, which 40 years later became the subject of a major motion yeah. picture, The Conjuring, uh, that was originally our case, my brothers and I, and we were members of a team based at Rhode Island College in providence and we were contacted by a mrs carolyn perron and she and her husband roger wanted us to come to their home their farmhouse in harrisville rhode island they'd been there two years they wanted us to evaluate their situation because they had some ghostly happenings there and uh, to that effect we went to their house and conducted what we felt was a scientifically based investigation mm -hmm. And then we contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren, with whom we were acquainted. And it was never that we felt we were in over our heads. Not that. It's just we knew Ed and Lorraine. Ed and Lorraine volunteered to come there once we alerted them to this situation. It's, oh, we want to be there. So we figured, hey, nice touch, a professional touch to benefit from the experience of the Warrens. And so uh, they were invited to come there. And they had invited themselves, but we readily agreed. And Ed and Lorraine came and was shown around and uh, was all very affable. I remember being on the phone with Ed Warren saying, oh, I understand we're going to continue to, to work on this case together. You know, we're consulting you. He said, oh, absolutely, yes. So I figured, well, this is good. Pyro is the name parapsychology investigatory and research organization at Rhode Island College. Pyro and the Warrens collaborating. This is going to be so, so cool and so effective. But once we brought the Warrens in, we ceased hearing from the parents. Uh, I was on the phone with Mrs. Carolyn Perrin. It would, this was August into September 1973, and I was on the phone with her. It could be 10 times a day. She would call me. We'd talk for an hour or so. Then something else would happen in their house, like something would be propelled across the room, or one time she was slicing an orange in her kitchen, and what seemed to be blood seeped out of the orange, and she called me right back, would tell me about this. So something was always going on there. But once the, the introduction of the Warrens, it ceased being an investigation and became an intercession, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, stopped hearing from Carolyn. So we have Pyro had our meeting and we said, well, either the Perrones are, either their, their case is, is become very intense and the Warrens are really helping them or it's been resolved and we don't need to hear from them anymore, but we're just not hearing back from Carolyn and Roger. So uh, a few weeks later, I did hear again from Carolyn. It was quite uh, different because I had been talking with this woman every day. And then, then she called me and said she was sorry for being out of touch, but the Warrens had instructed them that they could be of no help unless they were the sole investigators involved, sole paranormalist. They said we were just a bu bunch of college kids. We couldn't do any good, and they had to be in charge. So that you know that's why we didn't hear from them. And the association with the Perrones and the Warrens actually ended unfavorably, and that's kind of an understatement. So, yeah. Uh, well, that's in a nutshell, but I never had any bad feelings about it. I didn't then. I don't now. It's just the way things happen. So did you actually get to investigate the Conjuring House? 
Yeah, oh, yeah. And I'll call that just so that, that yeah. people understand. If, if, if you don't know the actual story, I'm just familiar with the movie, um, The Conjuring. But um, So y'all were actually first in. Yeah. Well, so it, did I investigate that uh, 47 years ago, or have I investigated it recently? No, no. 40, I, 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 yes. I want to hear first impressions. Like, what was your first impressions of the house? Because like, I know you can go in today. I think one of you actually seen something fly across the room in any place. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would call, oh, like, yes, cutting right. an orange and having it bleed a little yeah. more than, you know, ghostly activity. <laughs> what it was, what, it was a house built in 1736 at that time to absorb many, many memories the predominant family through the 19th century well the uh 18th century even going back that far was the arnold family they were the original owners and you know through successive generations uh the house changed ownership a few times uh i thought it was a haunted house and you know it wasn't a severe haunting it's different when somebody lives there. You know, when you're exposed to the, to the paranormal activity on an almost daily basis, yeah, that becomes unsettling. I didn't see anything so severe that I thought it would drive the family out. My parents had activity in their home. I don't think it was, uh, I don't think the parents, the Perron family was any uh, more severe in what they were experiencing, but it was interesting to be sure. Uh, the movie, of course, the movie version exaggerates and distorts many of the facts. And nonetheless, it was entertaining. Uh, there was a Perron family who owned that house in Harrisville, and that's about where it ends, except that, you know, it was haunted. And uh, it was an entertainment. But, you know, we were having, we built up a rapport with the parents, <coughs> and uh, Carolyn Perron was being really affected. You could say their name either way, you know, I, even they, I think, pronounced it different ways. And uh, Carolyn, the mother, the lady of the house, she seemed to be most affected. We had five daughters, Roger and Carolyn, and Carolyn, and uh, we were investigating, and this we happened to tell the Warrens about it. Then it became so overblown. Uh, Carolyn was receptive and sensitive to the impressions of the house. The house has a definite personality. James has been there a number of times. That was going to be my next question: Is has James, have you so visited the house? You know, it's absorbed memories. It's taken on its own uh, its own presence. And so uh, a seance was arranged at that house. I thought that was ill-advised, but I was no longer, you know, an active member of this <laughs> case. Uh, Lorraine Warren suggested that they have a seance because what else are you going to do in a haunted house but have a seance? And uh, it affected Carolyn deeply. Uh, at one point in this seance procedure, her body was propelled out of its chair and she flew across the room. Now, that's how bad it got. And uh, Roger, of course, ran over. And I wasn't there, but I've heard from a couple of eyewitnesses. Roger ran over to assist his wife. And she was, uh, she was actually speaking in a, a different tongue. You know, it wasn't even English anymore, just maybe gibberish. So Roger went over to help his wife. And Ed Warren blocked his way and said, you must never touch the possessed. It's not a thing to say to a concerned husband. You know? Right. Yeah. So it ended in a physical altercation. Uh, I heard Roger struck uh, Ed. He said, I think Ed lost that tooth, yeah. And uh, the result was they had a total falling out and the, the Perones became discouraged with paranormal groups. And uh, so that's how that ended, really. I mean, there's much more to say about it. I wish we could have stuck with it because we were really conducting what I thought was a productive investigation trying to ascertain what started it what was the source was you know evaluating carolyn uh, psychologically and i think we could have done more good for them but uh, yeah, it was what it was it was an interesting situation yeah. well, james you said you've been there yeah uh, no. thankfully through uh somewhat carl as well but i knew corey in some form of fashion um before uh before Corey and Jen bought the house. So when Corey and Jen bought the house, due to my friendship to Corey, and then of course as well Jen and their family, um, I was able to get to that house. But I grew up knowing about that house because Keith Johnson, uh, Carl's brother, wrote about it in Paranormal Realities before even Andrea wrote it in her books. I do believe so. You know, I, I kind of grew up, especially being around. You were like, it's it's a up. very familiar story, Carl used to talk about it yeah. in depth before even it became a thing. So like when it became a, a, a hit, a phenomenon, you know, I'm like, 
I know this house is like crazy. Yeah. It's like 20 minutes away from me. Um, you know, I heard about it. So I've heard the stories, people's perception of it being evil. You know, I've heard of, sto of the stories of the past owner before Corey and Jen, of course. Uh, He's referring to the Heinz and Corey and Jen Heinz yeah. and acquired the house in June of 2019 at yeah. current owners. But I've heard the stories. I've heard many interpretations of what it could be, of course. Famously, a lot of people want to jump to its evil because, of course, the connections to the Warrens and how the seance went bad. And, of course, people don't understand. If you're doing invitation, um, you allow yourself to be open so you could go in like a trance-like state if you are sensitive to certain things yes. um, and if you're perceived to it. So, you know, it gets the reputation of it being evil. But to be honest, that house to me is very peaceful home. I cannot say I haven't had experiences there. Like I've heard Nick's and Patty Wax and things I can't explain, but um, I can't necessarily say it was paranormal either because it is a old house. You know, I'm a foreman for a sheet metal company. I know air, I did plumbing, um, pipe fitting. So I understand that, you know, how, how houses unsettle, how it is old, how the drafts can happen in that house, the air infiltration. So maybe some of the sounds are natural and we want Doesn't to make it any less fascinating. It's still fascinating. It's still a great house. So, but I've had experiences there and I, I, it's still a beautiful home regardless. I think. Well, I know there's more to you guys than obviously the, the conjuring, what we call the conjuring. So what you were saying, James, actually just, you know, actually it's what I want to talk to you guys about is your specialty. Yeah, like a lot of, like we and a lot of our friends are on people know us, you know, paranormal investigators. We've been places I've experienced things. I've seen things. And don't hate me, but I can't say that I thoroughly believe in like evil entities or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I, we've gone to some pretty neat places, and I've been spooked I think once. <laughs> but I'm like, eh, you know, I'm not sure. So tell me a little bit about. I mean, like, obviously you're more than just what we would call paranormal investigator, like demonologist. What have you experienced, and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. If I tell you I'm a skeptic of that, I mean, we we deal with skeptics of paranormal. But if I say I'm a skeptic of the, I don't know if yeah. you call what do you call is it? Is evil entity the right word? Is it? Oh, well, yeah, it's very kind of colloquial, <laughs> but yes. I mean, we lack so scientific nomenclature for these forces. Uh, my definition of demonology is a systematic study of the lore and cultural traditions of wicked spirits. Okay. Now, we're constantly learning about these. You, you know, it's very difficult to isolate and prove the existence. Oh, yeah of right. something that's invisible like that but it is a, a viable force they're powerful in the sense that they're persistent they are disembodied presences uh, we think they're all malevolent what we guess if there are demons that don't mean us any harm if for some reason we don't seem to hear from them <laughs> uh, nasty was this i define a demon as a poltergeist with an attitude and an agenda you know kind of they they can move things around so we investigate these claims and uh, try to uh, try to determine causes. Like uh, who we mentioned earlier, Elise Giamarco Carlson, she is a realist, not so much a skeptic in that that can be a loaded term. Sometimes when people say skeptic, others feel that somebody doesn't believe in anything, just, you know, maybe anything but what we see. No, she's a realist. We try to, we aspire to that, to being realist, like observationalist. Know, but sometimes things get a little kaflui and you can't explain it away by ordinary scientific means. So that's when we step in. And as James was saying, we try to blend different approaches in academia and disciplines. You got to throw in psychology, uh, som somatic causes like, you know, air vents, air ducts, mm -hmm. uh, black mold, anything, you know, electric currents. The that, ammonia that we dealt with in the case one time. Yeah, of the cat house. <laughs> uh, yeah, that had a strong concentration of ammonia. And, uh, and, so you know, I can we have three cats. <laughs> when we are, oh, it's a cat house, yeah. When we are called in, I, I, uh, one famous case, it became famous, it was actually investigated by TAPS, the Atlantic Paranormal Society, and my brother Keith and I held membership in TAPS for eight years and were on the show Ghost Hunters the first two seasons. And then we left of our own accord. And uh, this house in Brooklyn, New York, oh, yes, they had genuine activity comparable to the, the Perron house in Harrisville. Just as much was going on in that house. Um, and it was, a, again, a very interesting, enthralling situation there. 
But having through the interview process and just coming to know the homeowners, getting to know them in the house's history, the people's history, I told the homeowner, I said, you know, it's not the paranormal that's so much your, your problem. Uh, the paranormal activity is the symptom of everything that's gone wrong here. That's the projection of it. You know, that alerted us, that let us know something is up here, but you, know, you have a lot of knots to untangle in your personal life. It's family just had somewhat of a bizarre history, you know, which we tried to help them with. I mean, they were charming, very likable people, but the, the home, the, the people who live in the house for generations just had strange histories, you know, and that's what incited the paranormal activity. Now there's a theory I call and others call projection. Well, uh, my co-author of Shadow Realms, Demonology Handbook, Lana, she uh, developed a theory about projection where actually these unresolved conflicts and trauma and uh, deep-seated emotions, which are, of course, psych psychological manifestations, are somehow projected outward, and that becomes the haunting. That's when things start moving around, objects move and are relocated, apparitions appear. Sometimes that is projected by components we don't fully understand, of components of the human mind, and it becomes the haunting, you know, and it's a symptom. You know, but too often, people who approach us feel that get rid of the ghosty, get, you know, get the paranormal influence on our, our lives will be normal. Well, maybe they weren't before. And I say normal as a loaded term, too, but we're just yeah. talking about unresolved conflicts, and that's where demonology uh, comes in. You know, an investigatory tool. So, you know, a lot of these are just projections of what's happening inside the head. I'm not saying imaginary. They're real phenomena. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A victim of your own demons, so to speak. Yeah. And I, I, I necessarily believe in a lot of Carl, what he believes in as well. Um, but I also tend to believe sometimes that a demon can be also something that do, does predate human yes. civilization, human being as well. But I think that's also rare and far few between than what he's explaining. Um, some of the cases I've dealt with, which um, I believe we both have talked about many times, is five and 15 years and, and 47 years for that. Cases that are. Well, we quantify as demonic. Yes. So, but it, in, <laughs> it's very rare. So, but in those cases, I tend to believe that. In my opinion, that all those cases were of something that were that predate human civilization, um, even our concept. So, and see, some people say, ah, how, "How do you believe that?" But I also think that even though evil only equates to human civilization, because before dualism, before karma, before uh, these things were created by human civilization, philosophers, mostly Greek, uh, you, you, what is it? Your, your progress? What is it? Epicurus, Epicurus. Oh yeah, Epicurus. Epicurus. Which would be modern term Epicurean. Yeah, you know. So the connoisseur. Yeah. So before that, there was really not that form of concept of evil as we look at it as now. But it's still, throughout human civilization, there's always been some concept of these malevolent, non-malevolent uh, and spirits. the good, the benevolent ones. Good as evil. Well. That dichotomy has been prevalent throughout even even before human history, history and I'm sure and yeah. I'm sure before. So. It's interesting to me that throughout human civilization, we've had something of this. Even, even people that we weren't, we weren't quite as intelligent as us as modern civilization as advanced, as advanced developed. Um, and developed. They still uh, made knowledge that these things existed. So, it's it. I think that we do uh, uh, come across these things, but it is very rare, and most of the time it is the concept of the human mind. He's talking about a purely inhuman spirit yeah. type. Um, and that's what a demon is. It, it was never physical. It's always been pure yeah. spirit. So what he's saying is sometimes yeah. a demon is just a demon. You know, it's <laughs> there's something that we beyond our understanding. Some would call it a fallen angel. Some would call it a demon. Some, wh whichever. Yeah. There's different terminologies, but also in the same concept, there are different characteristics and personalities that we equate to certain spirits, entities, yeah. poltergeist, right. uh, jinns. So, you know, it, that's what we do as demonologists as well. We, we sift through what people think they're dealing with or what certain things we can adequate to what we've dealt with or what other people have dealt with as well. And when it comes down to something you can't define and must be inhuman, it becomes unfathomable. Yeah. You don't know at a certain point where it came from. 
almost always though you can you can trace it in the uh, the people who are being afflicted something happened yeah. in their past yeah. you know there's some unresolved conflict and, and, and there's and, and people will debate that but there's there's a lot of formulas of modern science even though psychology as carl likes to quote it as and i really do agree even though psychology is uh, a scientific field. It is one above a suite of Well, science. I think it aspires to be a scientific field. So, it's made terrific advances over the last two centuries, yes. But, and that's still the same concept. Psychology still can't determine cer certain situations right. like demonic possession. Neuroscience can't th 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 pick some of these things and understand why. You know, MRIs are done on people that are quantified to be demonically possessed. You know, the Catholic Church and other people, other branches, go through these methods because we do believe that natural occurs and tends to occur a lot more than these evil forces tend right. to possess us or want to infest or oppress us. You know, we, we, we are measly humans compared to the whole universe. You know? Right. To make ourselves more important than what we are. But humanocentric. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, so, you know, this is what we see. We've got a world here, our yeah. little sector. So that's but the one thing that, important to us. The one thing that Carl and I always agree with, and we have, there are people that have come across this, but there most of the time that what we've come across uh, more specifically is the people that are being demonically possessed have had some sort of trauma, sort of thing that uh, intensified this or made it, made it the reason that it occurred. It was the invitation, that point of weakness that allowed certain some so, so, so parasitical, such an oppressive entity or spirit whatever you would like to call and it. Increase the vulnerability. Of the subject. The, yeah. yeah. And it allows it to uh, allow it in and takes that personality, that persona. Um, and, and it's hard. Some, some things can't be explained even by our modern standards. Right. And you could say in a very broad interpretation, when did, when were demons born? When did demons come into the earth? When people gained the propensity for speech, when people started to talk and mm. communicate at that level, you know, because then they could talk about good and evil influences in our world yeah. that affect human beings. In fact, talking about the origins of demons, there's a nice chapter in this book. <laughs> hey, that's what you're here for. Part of yeah. uh, um, a hypothesis of uh, demons coming onto the sphere, you know, onto our planet and all that. Mm. I said, if you want me to read it to you. you know. <laughs> yeah, we've got some questions coming yeah, in and, and let you guys know. We'll get to those in a little bit, but that kind of leads into a couple of things. So two different types of demonology or, or demons, um, as you've kind of entailed. And, and James, you're you're actually a deacon um, with the uh, USOCC, which is the United States Old Catholic Church, correct? Correct. Yes, I, I am. So we, we are... Catholic and you know of course within universal yeah, yeah part of the universal church but yeah definitely um, I'm a deacon and uh, before that I was an ordained minister with the Church of Christ right and you know the the views of of um, the rights of exorcism yes. uh, you know you describe two very unique um, you know situations where you have the um, the the demons that everyone's familiar with with hearing um, you know, in the Bible. Yep. Um, and then you have the demons that of course you create with your, with your mind and, yeah, um, demons. right. Are those handled the same way? Are you, are you performing rites of exorcism on both of those situations or? Well, so yes. Yeah, so uh, a man named Hippocrates, which is the father of medicine, another Greek philosopher, uh, um, actually used exorcisms uh, as a form of psychotherapy on people that believe that they were possessed, but emphatically were actually being affected by something psychological, even though maybe they could have obtained why it was happening, but they found out that doing these certain rituals could make that person believe that it worked and they would be. So Hippocrates performed exorcism. He did. did he so not? he yeah. did. Um, so yes, it can be performed on somebody that is hypergullible and that believes that it could work and does work and change their mentality and put them on good track and get them out of that manic state. But it could also do injustice and uh, actually intensify and make their psychological affliction worse. So it, it has to really be predetermined. That's why when the Catholic Church gets involved, especially specifically me or Carl, maybe who does assess the case for the church or any other demonologist like Ralph Sarchi or Dave Giuliano, whoever, 
Um, if they do work with the church, they require, if somebody's claiming possession, they require assessment. Even the old Catholic Church, even the United States old Catholic Church, our bishops require um, a psychological assessment because they want to see if they are going to hit something from the DSM and say, this is what they have, this is what it is, and this is the possibilities. We want to be aware of that thing because we don't want to tread on waters. There, there are dangers to exorcisms. This has been known in entertainment, shown in entertainment, even though it is uh, overly dramatized sometimes, death can happen uh, from exorcisms. Annalise McKell is a perfect example. Annalise McKell, yes. Um, so there's cautions, and we deal with physicians and psychotherapists because we want to make sure we're adequately approaching it, that we are uh, checking the boxes in the natural. First, I like the way you put that, before, checking the boxes. You before we jump to the preternatural, because mm -hmm. what happens if, if they are bipolar, one or two schizophrenia? Right. Um, and the medicine, even though I'm not a big medicine person, but it does help. And what happens if that medicine was needed for them to uh, change the chemicals, their imbalance in their brain, and it puts them in a better place? I'm not going to perform an exercise, uh, which I'm not an exorcist, I can't. Right. I'm speaking hypothetically. If I'm not going to perform an exorcism on for somebody that um, hasn't been checked out yet, because what happens if they are schizophrenic? I'm feeding into their gullibility, and it, like I said, it could either that could be for the better or the worse. worse. And if it's yeah. worse, you're putting them at risk. And what happens if they do something stupid when you leave? They kill somebody, kill themselves. I'm at risk, so I, I have to worry about myself. But I have to worry about the people that I administer to people that uh, because they're going to look to who was the last person to deal with this, yeah. you know, this situation and intervene, yeah. you know. And if it's demonologists, they're really going to seem liable. And and in the DSM, they they do have possession in there. There are forms of psychological possession, but there are, are also forms of demonic possession. And a lot of psychologists are on the fence of it, but. A lot of them are towards the wing that they have encountered true demonic possession. There are psycho psychologists yeah. that work with the Catholic Church that are, that have been involved in situations. They're actually retained by the Catholic yeah. Church, so you know some because the, therapists. There's no way of determining. So these are things that we have to do. You know, sometimes we don't go as fully in depth as we should sometimes because we do see the dangers. Specifically, yeah. car. You know, he's been around it specifically me who's been around that as demonologist but maybe a standard investigator will quantify something or look at something differently because they see something on entertainment they will jump to that conclusion as yeah that's a key word entertainment there so so on one end of the spectrum you've got the strict clinicians and then you have the witch doctors the total you know like psychic can you know evaluate through you know impressions and all that not always a bad thing then you've got us in the middle trying to join the two disciplines of the two approaches, you know, and try to evaluate. It kind of leads into this question. <laughs> so, yeah, so to Darren's question, uh, what has been the most disturbing case or situation, whatever, that you've been on? It's maybe changed how the way you think, that you view things. Well, mine was my second residential situation into which I entered, the first one being the Perone family in Harrisville, mm -hmm. but then, some time after, I was invited to assess uh, a case in Providence, Rhode Island, and that turned out to be a situation of full-blown demonic possession. By many really? definitions, it was demonic possession. Really? The subject was a 14-year-old boy. Oh, that's sad. And I will say at the onset, this was successfully resolved. It wasn't uh, an unhappy ending by any means, and it was... I felt I did something, I performed a valuable service for these people. Much of it was subjective, although he was evaluated psychologically, you know. Uh, and he, this boy uh, was being taken over by an invasive personality. Now, when I was first surprised at this or alerted to it, I was thinking he it's probably epilepsy with some overtones of schizophrenia, to use very general terms. But I was invited to stay the night because even then I was quite young and uh, I had a reputation as a paranormal investigator who would stand his ground and not flee the scene. And I was hoping that was true, you know, uh, <laughs> because I hadn't been to the thorough test. But, but it was valuable to me because this showed me that I could stand my ground. I could stay there when things got hairy. 
And every fiber of my being was telling me, get out of here. This is just not for me. I'm not an expert. I, I'm not an expert in the unknowable. I, I just don't belong here. I don't feel right about it. But if I had left, would I be able to go back again to something like that? Something hair raising and frightening, and unpredictable. That's where it really becomes unsettling. You can't predict what's going to happen from a minute to minute. And it had all the scary overtones that you would expect from a demonic possession if you can, can anticipate anything. But I stuck with it. And uh, probably the most hair raising moments, the most challenging moments was when I had to look at this boy who was in a fit of possession, however that's defined, we'll call it possession, uh, to look into that hellish face, that expression, with bulging eyes and lips drawn over teeth that looked as though his gums were receding, to look at this ferocity, you know, to look at basically what seemed insanity and stand there looking at him directly and calmly and uh, actually approach him and stand close to him to show him I wasn't afraid, you know, and that's that was a turning point for me. And again, it was it was successfully resolved. I didn't know what was going to happen, how it would turn out. And, uh, an expulsion was arranged. And I think that was uh, my most frightening case, a situation I've been involved in to date. I've had other <laughs> unsettling moments. <laughs> but um, I was invited to stay overnight. This is how it started. And uh, I was, I believe, 20 years old and uh, 20, 21 at the time. And this young man, 14 years of age. So we were, there wasn't this huge disparity in our ages anyway. I was uh, reclining on a sofa in a parlor room in the third floor of this uh, three-story house in the West End of Providence. Uh, the boys' room was uh, adjacent to a, a sofa upon, upon which I was reclining. So I got to be about one in the morning. I had a wristwatch, and I figured I'd sack out for a while. Okay, I just started to drift off to sleep. And then I was awoken or, you know, alerted by this blood curdling scream. You know? And uh, I fumbled for the light switch on the wall. You know, oh, he's screaming. You know what? He sounded like he was being flayed alive. So I, I turned on the light switch. His door, as I turned it on, I saw his bedroom door open and on its own. And this boy's body was flung out through the air, out of the room. There was nobody else in that on that floor of the, the house his body was thrown out of the room smashed against the wall and started to spin around the floor <laughs> i mean he had a fetal wow. position and his body can whoosh 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 and he's screaming all through it his body is careening off the walls and then uh by this time other people heard the screaming a couple of other family members came upstairs he went into the room this boy did a backwards flip onto the sofa upon which I had been reclining, so I had to jump up and down and flap his hands. His deep guttural laughter came from his throat. Then he looked at me. Oh, he was, his eyes were dots for pupils. And he jumped at me. I figured I'm in control here. So I, I tried to restrain him gently. Uh, he, he just pushed me. He was a slender boy. He pushed me right off. And then he came to himself, and if, if I needed any more convincing that something, you know, something beyond the means of us to explain was it foot, you know, a foot there, he he came to himself, but he was trembling and crying, calling for his uncle to come to him. So that's when an expulsion, which is a form of minor exorcism, a procedure of driving out an invasive spirit, was arranged. Clergy was involved; they weren't dispensed by the Vatican, but there was clergy present for this right of uh, expulsion not so much a right but a procedure and i remember we were seated uh, those present participating were seated in a semicircle the boy was uh, at a makeshift altar one side of the room smiling but looking nervous and uh, apprehensive and, uh then there were prayers offered and then something changed in that room we are now on the first floor of this house uh, it sounded like a truck going by or an earth tremor. The, the house shook, but it was no, you know, no vehicles going by. It just felt like an earth tremor. Then it became deadly silent. And my chair with me in it went all the way back across the floor to a wall in back of me. I hardly knew what was happening, but while it was happening, you know, my chair just pulled back. And this, this boy fell to the floor 
went through those gyrations, was taken over by the spirit. It was just uh, horrendous what transpired over that next mm. perhaps hour and a half. But the spirit seemed to be driven out. We demanded a sign. I believe what happened was when we, you know, I was saying, you know, you must give us a sign of your departure. You're going to leave this boy. You're going to leave this child of God. You're going to give us a sign. And then the blinds went like that. Go, go, you know. So, and uh, one of the most striking things that happened during that hour, hour and a half, was there is a picture of Jesus, and it flipped itself over so that it was upside, upside down. Religious iconography was flying off the walls and off tables and all that. I wouldn't say it was without any comedic moments because there was a bowl of holy water and he took that and doused that on me. So I just went like that. But when the spirit seemed to leave him or be leaving him, he was screaming. I went over and probably shouldn't. It was ill advised to touch a supposedly possessed subject. But I went over and held him and rocked him until it was gone and uh, oh many things I could tell about that but that was my most uh, the scariest the most challenging experience there. Well, I think that that's a uh, <laughs> yeah okay James do you want to top that I don't know if yeah. I can <laughs> well, I what, you, what you got James come on it's <laughs> not a really succinct way to think. <laughs> James had I, an experience he sure did yeah so I I did not believe in demons at one point, you know, of course, my introduction to the paradigm was very long and uh, very expensive why I got involved into mm -hmm. it. But yes. I necessarily didn't believe in demons because um, as like, even though I was not Catholic at that point, at most Catholic, most Catholic priests uh, don't believe in demons. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's a... It's That's part a, of our well, it's part of our creed, yeah. We yeah, we, so, we say it out loud, we reject Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so, which is what we see as demons, yeah. Yeah. So they don't believe in demons and that uh, they believe if you claim demonic possession, you are crazy. So I didn't believe in demons either. You know, I think there is enough uh point to say that science has come a long way, psychology or neuroscience mm -hmm. has come a long way to disprove a lot. But like I said, we call upon no specialists most of the time to help in our assessment. And um, this is one, one of the times in Salem, Massachusetts, that I was actually called in by a psychologist. Um, and it kind of stunned me. I never had been involved in something that I would call demonic before. Demonic, yeah. Maybe negative, maybe poltergeist, maybe something that they perceived. But I was also more gullible back then. I was very inexperienced. So maybe I also came across things that maybe I didn't also understand at that point in time. But I never came across something that would strike me that I was in the presence of evil, that I was shaken, um, distraught. You know, I understand the mind, the chemical, you know, reaction, fight or flight, which is a true thing. Um, so I never had that moment. I was never in fear of anything. And I don't think I've ever been really necessarily in fear of what I've dealt with. But the this case in Salem, Massachusetts, when I got into that property, um, drove up onto that property. I've never felt um, the trembling I've ever felt in my life before. My body instantly said, dude, you got to get out of here. Um, and, of course, I'm stupid, so I'm not going to leave. I'm going to be like, oh, uh, okay, let's see what this is about. It's like, you know, you jump out of the plane. You're like, oh, my God, why am I doing But this is so cool, so cool. So it's like the same, same, same moment of euphoria. And – even though you're scared crapless, your body's scared crapless, you still want to go in there. So, of course, I felt that. I felt like I was getting punched in the soul plex over and over again until I got into that moment of that house. And, of course, this was a young couple, um, 22 years old, this person was. Uh, and I wasn't much older either. And not much bigger than I. I'm 5'11". I would say maybe 6'1". Six, six six um, this is the subject. Is subject. 22 year old yeah, um, slender and... You know, but walking into the house, I've heard also about some experiences some of the members have had. Yeah. Um, some prestigious people that were a part of this group called PRISM at that point in time, which I was a member of. I was their demonology consultant. Um, and one of the members was a psychologist who was brought, brought actually, was, she was the founder and she brought us all in. And at that point in time, they felt, felt like they needed my services. Um, they tried everything in the book, of course. Um, she, she followed the clinical aspects yeah. of things. They really followed the spiritual aspects of things. Follow things weren't the working. Proper protocol. Pro pro proper protocols. And 
I got there and I was there just to assess and maybe do a house cleansing and checking out the property. I just felt sick throughout that whole part. I just felt uneasy. And I got to the point where I was about to do the house cleansing and maybe even say a prayer over him as well. And throughout that whole process, you know, he, I asked them to leave. I, it's their place. Of course, they don't have to, but in a certain circumstance like that, where I felt uneasy. Um, and of course I've never felt like this way before. And I felt like there was something nefarious at play. Um, this is one time I could say that I wasn't necessarily feared, uh, feared of the situation. I thought, I felt like I could be a help, but I was also, of course, like I said, trembling and, uh, in the presence of what was there. And, you know, they want to leave, they were outside, but doing the house cleansing, um, did not occur because of that until afterwards. So when you say they wouldn't leave. Who do you mean? When the, the, the subject, the subject, subject wouldn't leave the premises. So we, you know, in an emergency situation, we felt like it was needful maybe to say a prayer over him. And we sat him across at the end of a table. And we have a few people. We have two guys at like a 300, 350 pounds, two former bouncers. They're very yeah. big guys. Like I, I'm not, I don't fear anybody or anything because I have a good faith. Well, I, I hate spiders, but, <laughs> uh, we'll play. but I, I really, I really have my faith in God. And for a while I have now, so I really don't fear much. But if anything at all, and this, you know, I, but I would not fight these guys. I would not want to like say something mean to them. They, they would throw it down with me and smash me in a second. But um, so I had these big guys there and this guy's no much bigger than I am the subject. And I'm about to say prayers, you know, um, of course, I'm getting all my, uh, my relics, my salt, my, my incense, um, my, my oils, my water. Just to, to, to perform a ritual, and this was going to be a deliverance over this individual, just to see what the reaction would be and see if there would be maybe any help. Because like I said, I didn't believe in a demon, even though I was in this situation. So I thought maybe saying this deliverance over him would sever anything that he had ties with, or maybe it would help. Maybe he wouldn't need any form of anything beyond this deliverance or this prayer over him. So imagine an archway, a sheetrock archway. Uh, he's standing in the archway uh, between the kitchen yeah. and, of course, the, uh, the dining room where the kitchen table was, where we were going to perform um, this deliverance over him so he could sit in a chair. He grabbed onto the archway, and I, I don't know if you've ever tried to crumble sheetrock. I'm a foreman for sheetrock. I work around sheetrock all the time. I've helped him carp. You know, I'm good friends with Carpenter. I've done work with him before. I've been around sheetrock. It's hard to grasp on a sheetrock and start crumbling with your bare hands, um, unless you're like some like Arnold Schwarzenegger, some <laughs> bodybuilder, so some dude that just like with one punch will just like take your life, like Mike Tyson or something like that. It's so like the sheetrock started trembling um, and falling down, and we we're like, you need to calm down. We, we sat him down, and I started to ask some questions. Do you believe in God? Is God here for you right now? And there was just a switch. A t the, the, that kitchen table was thrown at me. Um, I had a set of rosaries that, um, and this, of course, is when I started saying prayers over him. I was actually, this is a comedic moment okay. as well. It's Captain Morgan. It has to be one comedic I was moment. Captain Morganing the table that was <laughs> half while I had the cr uh, crucifix to him and saying prayers. So, but I'm still shaking. My body's shaking while I'm saying this the whole time. I'm like, yeah. you know, so. I'm really like, it, it is like everybody's so shocked. These two guys, once you threw the table, these two big bouncy guys just put him against the wall. And he's, of course, like I said, not much bigger than I am. And he is tossing and tussling with these people. I'm getting close with the crucifix, and all of a sudden, I don't know if he dislocated the shoulder, but I would assume so because he was able to get out and able to grab the rosaries. And I didn't know about these rosaries until afterwards because I wanted to see if I could repair them. I didn't know this yeah. already. I just piled them up quickly at the end to get the hell out of there after everything was mm -hmm. said and done because I'm like, my mind's exploded even at that point in time. But so saying he's, he was able to grab onto me. Um, one of the crazy things is where I believe it was demonic possession. And of course, a lot of other people that were involved. Um, so to say what I say, it was as well, or they, they don't know what they experienced. Uh, it, uh, it was just definitely mind blowing, but 
they he did vomit at the end of it. He did relieve himself, and um, it for, unfortunately did not work. It did not take, and I think it was because of the connection. Yep. And it, it really went badly. Um, yeah, they're not all successful. No, it's not. By any means. And unfortunately, like a lot of people that were involved, and this does happen in true demonic cases. And this is where this lot of qualifications be towards why, why I do believe this was uh, a yeah. transient possession of a demonic force is because um, at the end of it all, it, it ruined our friendships. It, 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 it split everybody that was involved. In I don't think case. you come out of a demonic situation. And it took totally, toll. It took know? toll on everybody. But the one thing that it did to me, which which surprised me, shocked me, I really started understanding and try, uh, attempting to Because on the end of your narration, you were saying you didn't believe in demons. Then. But well, one thing it did, instead of demoralize me, of course, it demoralized my friendships. But it actually made my faith in God stronger, um, because it, 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 something I seen that blew my mind conception, blew everybody's mind conception, a psychologist's mind, you know. So it, it was shocking from start to finish of that case. Even though I wasn't involved in every minute of that case, the parts that I was involved in it, were just balls to the wall, yeah. insane. Um, not everything that you would think like you would see in possessions, like, of course, his eyes did go black, fully black in, in just a second, if less a millisecond. Um, his face started pointing out triangulating, triangulating yes. um, his cheekbone structure. Like it was just crazy. Like it, it just mind blown. I, I will never, I'm a very forgetful person when it comes to names. Um, I have, he's on the left and I have a file cabinet full of names. And unfortunately, sometimes I don't remember these people's names because I'm so bad with um, remembering names, but like certain cases like that, like that case in Salem, Massachusetts, I will never forget that person's name. I will always remember it. It's something I will always remember. And those are the cases like yeah. that, that stick to you because it, they're just not what you expect. And even though we've dealt with them every time we deal with a case like that, it still blows the expectations. It's still a whole new kind of case. So these are situations where both of us came face to face confrontation with the demonic realm. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, there are psychological ramifications galore. And then there's that element you, you kind of transcend this, the explainable. And then you get into something more preternatural. You never totally, you, you can't really evaluate it totally yeah. and say, where did the psychology leave off? Where did something more supernatural begin? But, these, yeah. they, but they're both uh, very challenging, informative yeah. cases for us. Well, that's to say, because that's one of the questions kept popping up. I was like, you talked about the psychological, right? And going through that, you eliminate, eliminate. I think people are curious. How do you know when someone's possessed? So if you've eliminated the, what I'll call this, common scientific or the common yeah. psychological you know facts if you will i'm sorry but if i saw black eyes and cheeks pop <laughs> the paranormal is right it's unexplained you may not be able to explain it at the right time. i mean we I don't know what we don't know that's the, why we do what we do we don't know what's out there we don't know everything's different or there's so many different theories but i i think i'd agree with you that if i Yep, I think they're a little bit off the chain. Yeah, is there a is, yeah, and Stuff I guess, flying around the room, yeah. You know, Candace's question here, um uh how do you know? And I, I I'm I'm guessing there's not a book that you go to and you can't check off boxes, yep, yep. Pupils dilated, check, uh cheekbones changing shape, check, you know. Um <laughs> yeah, spinning, <laughs> flying across the room and doing backflips on the couch, yes, check, check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your prerogative, you know. So what are you, what do you, what are, what is, you know, Where's the average person, okay, let's, let's spin this around. The average person, let's say a paranormal investigating team such as myself, uh, we walk into a situation um, and, and demonic possession or evil and demons is something that's thrown around a lot in the field today. Yeah. Um, and people, we get asked all times, like, do you think that what's in my house is demonic? And I, and I tell them, I'm like, yeah. I, you know, I think if there was something demonic here, you would 100% know, and it'd be more than just, you know, hearing some footsteps and things like that. You would, I think you would know that, that something more is going on, but what, what would the, you know, the average person who is living in a situation like this, like what, maybe what it's some like more of advice to the, the, the uh, regular paranormal investigators. <laughs> well, if it, if it gets to the level where it seems intolerable, 
then it could very, very well be demonic. You know, because a human generated spirit, as we think they some of them are, the ghost is generally not going to misbehave to the uh, to the point where the people want to leave the house. It's just going to be somewhat creepy and mm. scary. But if it's demonic, it has an agenda. It's going to want the people out or want to torment them. And you'll know if it, if it's like, you know, this is just, this is bad. Things are happening. It doesn't want us here. Then you get things like literal writing on the wall or various manifestations or pictures are disappearing and showing up in other places. And like, you know, the religious picture mm -hmm. like turned upside down. And if it responds to religious provocation, regardless of the, the homeowner's faith, if you know, you speak the holy name of Jesus, and you, know, you say prayers like the prayer to Saint Michael, the warrior angel. Then, uh, yeah, then you you may never be sure it's demonic, and we it's just that we lack different terminology. But then it's probably demonic if it's severe like mm -hmm. that. Now, demons and their power can be overestimated. They they behave like tantruming children, but they're also persistent. So you should not overestimate nor underestimate the power of the demon, you know, but generally if it becomes intolerable like that, and there are signs like uh, overt foul odors that you can't explain. And they all, these, these symptoms blend together. Uh, you find writings on the wall that tell the people to leave, you know, um, it's generally like a poltergeist beating up on one. You know, um, so after a while, and it, it, it's all different. That's why it's so difficult to generalize. Uh, because the, the haunting may be as individual as the people who were living in that house. You know, you're only as, as educated as your last demonic mm. situation. So if it's really, if it's supremely inconvenient, then we think it might be demonic, especially if children are involved and the children start to see something. Uh, I can liken it to the case in Brooklyn, New York, to which I alluded earlier, that uh, the, uh, one of the subjects, uh, one of the, I think it started with her, was the 14-year-old girl living in the house started when she was 13 she started to see a nice lady come into her room a lady with black hair dressed in white would come into her bedroom at night but then the child became scared because she said, the lady isn't friendly anymore she smiled and her teeth were pointed so that's like uh oh <laughs> yeah then her mother started to see a shadowy form over move, move through the house and that's when we were called in then the parents start to see things you know so I would, I would call that demonic. Mm. But again, I think it was brought in through negativity, you know, the things that transpired in the house. Yeah. Um, I, just real quick. So I never, I never kind of a little, little bit ever. You haven't um, affected your mood. I know, but it's very happened. interesting. It's very interesting. Um, so at the very beginning, you said something that I think uh, is very common. What we talk about too is, is about intent, one's intent. Yes. Um, and also, you know, you bring in the faith. We have this discussion often, like I walk, I have a strong faith in God and people walk into a room and they, they're like freaking out. And I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> and I, so when you play in that intent, belief, whatever, do you think that does play a part? Uh, and I'll pick on the stories we saw you hear about people talking about portals. We all heard the Ouija boards bad. I admit I did one last week and we kind of laughed. We did it at Wildwood and we're like, well, nothing happened. <laughs> But we, I think we think we did it wrong. <laughs> I, just for the record, I didn't do it. Yeah, John I don't, it. I don't mess around with yeah, it. I with that Ouija board. <laughs> but like, what is? I mean, but, but I sat down with the belief that this is fake, right? I sat there and go, "This is ridiculous." So, what? How, in your opinion, in your experience, whether it's no matter what the scenario, what are your thoughts on that? The tent, and portals, whatever Ouija board, uh, that whole. A lot of intent comes from new thought, the new thought movement. But, uh, of course, the laws of attraction, yes. if you put out the negativity, the negative right. will come back. There's a lot of bylaws of certain religions. Look at Wicca, they, you know, threefold rule, uh, Hinduistic and Buddhism with karma and, of course, sinning and repenting your sins in Christianity. So there's a lot of aspects of intent through our culture. And I do think it has something to do with it because... Um, how a demonic haunting occurs is infestation, oppression, of course, is obsession, and then possession, which comes in different forms as well. Okay. But there has to be some sort of uh, switch in intent. Some people want it, so people sometimes obsess, and they want that. You mean they become preoccupied? Preoccupied by it. 
So Intenta has a lot to do with it uh, as far as the Ouija board. Um, one thing I like to say is I necessarily won't use the Ouija board because I don't You're think con it, Ouija board. Well, I, like Ouija. I don't think it's meaningful. I don't think it's. I don't meaningful. either. I just, um, yeah. And I don't say that I don't think people can't have experiences from it, but I look at it as um, I use the metaphor a hammer can use to bang nails or it can be used to bang mm -hmm. skull. In. <laughs> as bad as that sounds so bad, you can use any tool in the form of fashion that you put your mind to. And that and then you get attached. it baptized with the law. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Because so, what we did, it was during the day. You <laughs> to to something evil or something as a spirit, if that is your perception and you're using it for that application. Yeah. So, but out of, as far as Ouija boards, I, I, I like to go by a statistic because I'm a statistic man. Is that you're, a, sta all, you're a statistician? A statistician. <laughs> hey, that one good? Yeah. Ooh. But razzmatazz. The razzmatazz. Uh, but <laughs> out of all the cases that I've ever dealt with, the Ouija board was only a piece of the puzzle in one of the cases. Yeah. Piece of the puzzle. It was the factor, it was the cause. But I think any but tied time, in with what. You but I think any time that you are dealing with a haunting or traumatic experience and you are relaying it to the paranormal, exactly. yeah, and sense. you are trying to communicate with yep. something, you're already doing bad things. Yeah. That makes sense. Your Ouija board, it could be your phone asking questions to a spirit. Right. So in any way, if you reach out for the wrong reason, you can get what you want. By the way, the proper word is statistician. Statistician. I don't want to. Mar you for life with that word, <laughs> so you're never able to say it again. Yeah. So, so Carl, at least wants your opinion of the board with a winky face. Yeah, my own feeling on Ouija boards is they're just so unreliable. They can be make for an interesting experiment, and sometimes you get remarkable as results. But you know, you can't rely on them as a cogent uh, tool mm. for evaluating. Yeah. Nice. And are they really any different than asking a question with a recorder or asking it to move something in form of, it, their form of communication? Or what and, we did, like, you know, acting stuff out and happen, hoping that, you know, depending on, again, yeah. depending on the spirits that are there, like you said, residual, you've got intelligent, you know, whether you've got the independent ones there. Where, yeah. I can see, where I can see people equating danger with it beside, of course, um, I have a communication speaking or communicating to the dead is the fact that of course you are using yourself with the planchette to um, have spirit help guide the planchette. So you're allowing spirit into your technical bubble because there is bioelectric fields that, we have that we give off. It's, you know, we can talk about that too and bore you, but um, but the thing is, it's true. We talk about it because it's fact. You know, he imagines the egg shape around him. I imagine, you know, of course. That protective aura that you so, visualize. That thing, it, the thing is, is when you invite somebody in your, your bubble like that, you're allowing more of an invitation than maybe putting a recorder on the other side of the room, speaking to that red button, you're not coming close to me. So there are people that approach it that way, and they're not necessarily wrong either. So there are differences in that form or fashion. And I think that one device maybe lead to uh, more of a attempt at a communication you don't want. But of course you can get the same reaction from putting a digital recorder down and asking the same question. And what is the difference, the essential difference, the intrinsic difference mm -hmm. between a seance where people are seated around a table an trying to establish <laughs> <That's here we laughs> an investigation where you, use, where you record, you know, what are you recording trying to capture spirit voices through the process of EVP? No. There really isn't none. A friend of mine said, when, yeah. when is a seance not a seance when you call it something else? You know, but <laughs> hopefully you're doing the old school with the seance procedure, but you're recording it and filming it too. Mm. You know, True. try to get the best of both worlds, see what comes through. Uh run over our hour i apologize but you guys oh, have been oh, absolutely oh, 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 by too quickly it's yeah, we got it we got to <laughs> get a lot of questions in the chat about the book so go over the the book and where folks can go to get it again and <laughs> shadow realm demonology shadow Realms demonology handbook you can acquire that through amazon.com or through the authors you know myself lana j brock you know shadow realms demonology. oh you read all that yeah yeah, yeah. But it's a primer on demonology. It's not the definitive work on demonology by any means, but it's a 
It's meant just like the title infers, it's something you can carry with you to a paranormal investigation. It's yeah, uh, case it histories and you know, <laughs> a list of demonic names, the roster of demonic names included. And it's some things that I had done that went right and some things I would have done differently. There, it's a series of essays as well. So it's just something like, hey, how did these people deal with uh, their situation? Let's see if there's anything similar to what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. You might get something from it. I think it's an easy and enjoyable read. It's uh, 300 pages. You should read this. No, I mean, I, I don't have it memorized, but it's 300 pages, and I just think it's a, a valuable mm -hmm. tool. It's just not, you know, I don't think you're going to yeah. answer all questions, but just one, uh, two people's perspectives. Yeah, and if you want to, a uh, quick, easy link, we do have an easy memes. I still don't understand how we got it, but www.demonology.org, <laughs> right there. You have um, domain? How, how did you get that? But you can also oh. go to the About Us section. There is about Duo Demonology, but there's also about Carl Johnson as well. And, of course, within that About section, there is a link to his book. So if it is easier for you to find it that way, go to demonology.org about Carl Johnson and his link to his book will be there clickable um, if you want to grab his book. Yeah, it's accessible. Well, we appreciate you guys coming on. I hope on. we get to meet you in person someday. Maybe you this oh, whole yeah. Yeah. You know, no, you About our case histories, you know, how do we, you know, what was the hairiest thing we ran into, you know, so you, you can't just tell that in three minutes. More like 15. Oh, freedom here. <laughs> I feel pretty lucky. <laughs> no, but you did a great job. I remember here like reading. Like, you so much. It's been a pleasure being your bend, guest. Spinning on the floor. I know. Now I'm going to go to bed and like, really? People can do like flipping the air <laughs> tables. <laughs> I have to admit, I don't know if I ever saw that if I'd be scared or if I'd go. At first, I'd be scared and I'd go, wow, that's cool. I don't know. It was. It got my attention, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, never seen, I've never seen that. So some, you know, some people will never. You know, I think it's it's in some form. Tiger of that. black eyes and the cheeks all poking out. That's. I was I was scared. Not a horror film. <laughs> All right, uh, Carl James, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, Y'all uh, <laughs> both stay healthy. You can leave the comments. There's some questions that we didn't get to. I think the majority of the, what was asked, though, you guys did a great job of covering. So uh, even the questions that were coming up, we you eventually covered in some shape or form. But we appreciate having you guys on. No, um, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate everybody for tuning in and watching. And um, go check them out um, at uh, demonology.org. Uh, we've thrown the uh, the links up in the chat, and they're also available on our Facebook page. So go check them out, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks a lot. All right, Thank thanks. You. Good night. Bye. Take care.